What's up, Cora? Welcome to Fort Cannon Seg, brother. How you doing? Hey, doing well. Thanks for having me. Man, uh, let's just go ahead and get right into it because this is a subject I've been absolutely passionate about. Uh, you've been way more passionate about your way smarter than I am when it comes to this particular subject, my man. Um, and I appreciate everything it is that you're doing. So let's first and foremost talk. All right. Pandemic. We go into March. Right. And I have made the argument that this has been we may not even get another opportunity in, in history um, where a lot of focus is on the public education system. And so many people now see something as minimum like at minimum is wrong with it right something something is incorrect with it and there may be an opportunity to take probably the biggest acts that we'll ever be able to take because of i mean it sucks that it had to come by way of a pandemic but would you agree that this has been an opportunity uh for a lot of we be it parents a lot of uh could be potential parents to see how rotten really this this public education system is yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is what I've said to be one of the only silver linings of the pandemic. Uh, the way that I put it is that COVID didn't break the public school system. It was already broken. Mm. Uh, COVID just exposed the problems that already existed in the traditional public school or what uh, uh, libertarians like to call the government run school system. There's been an uneven power dynamic between the producers of the product, the government and the consumers of that product, the families and their children. And even before COVID uh, school closures, families were getting the short end of the stick when it came to K-12 education because the schools are failing their children year after year. And if they didn't like it, it was pretty much too bad. If they wanted an alternative to that system, they'd have to pay out of pocket, essentially paying for two schools, one through the compulsory property tax system, then the other through the uh, out-of-pocket expenses for the private school tuition and fees. But this year, this uh, there's been a spotlight that's been shined on this uneven power dynamic in the public school system and just the problems with the traditional public school system. It's one thing for the schools to not adequately educate your children year after year. It's another conversation altogether when the schools aren't even opening. Yeah. Families are scrambling, trying to figure out some other uh, solution to their problems. And then the government run schools are getting to keep your children's education dollars regardless of of them even opening their doors. And just really quickly before I talk about this too long is that this response to the pandemic has been absolutely different from the private sector as opposed to the public sector. The private schools have been opening in so many different places where they've been fighting to reopen or even fighting against governments in some places, taking it all the way up to the Supreme Court in Kentucky, for example, to for the right to reopen the schools. Whereas the public schools and the teachers unions have been fighting to remain closed. And I think the difference is one of incentives. Mm. One of these institutions gets your money regardless of whether they even open their doors for business. And I think more and more people are seeing this. And the latest uh, polling on this at the national level is from Real Clear um, Opinion Research. And they found that between April and August, support for school choice or funding students directly has gone up by 10 percentage points from 67% to 77%. And it's because so many families are saying that the government school system just isn't going to be for them for them, isn't going to be there for them this year. Right. I and mean, it makes all the sense, certainly in the world. Um, have you seen like I would imagine you have, I don't know what you keep in close tabs on this. Have you seen that, that uptick, that huge uptick at, at all in people considering even like more alternatives, be it, uh, private school uh, or anything in, in in instead of going the traditional like public school route has the during this pandemic have you seen a, a, an uptick at least in families taking that in more so in a consideration going into the future yep so that real clear opinion research poll found support for school choice broadly but we've also seen people actually voting with their feet already to private alternatives and to homeschooling alternatives all across the nation. If you look overall nationally, the latest Gallup poll on the uh, subject estimates that prior to, uh, that since last year, the proportion of children in traditional or government run schools is expected to go down by seven percentage points or about three and a half million students. And uh, they also estimated that homeschooling will double in real terms, which would be about 3% pre-pandemic to 6% in 2020. And if you look at 
hard data from individual states. We, we see this everywhere. Home, homeschool filings went up by about 800% in Massachusetts, by about 280% in Texas. We saw public school enrollment drops uh, from anywhere between three to 9% in all of these different states. We saw private school enrollment going up in Massachusetts uh, as far as transfers from the public school system by 80% this year. Wow. So we're seeing this everywhere. It's just there's a huge shakeup in people voting with their feet. And then just also people are re-envisioning, one, the factory model of schooling, how it's it's a huge problem in so many places. Uh, but then also they're re-envisioning how we fund education. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to fund the institution when you can fund students directly instead. And I like to point this out for so many other people. And, you know, libertarians uh, in, in large numbers do not support these other programs uh, such as food stamps and Pell Grants and the GI Bill and, pre and state funded pre-K pre programs. But if we're going to have that taxpayer funded uh, uh, funding allocated to these different types of educational services and non-educational services, I think even libertarians who oppose food stamps agree that if we're going to have that funding it's better it's better to have that funding go to people instead of straight to government run right. grocery stores right. for example right and so a lot of the people who support funding students directly when it comes to pre-k and when it comes to higher education through the pell grant they, they had to all of a sudden have a huge problem with it when it comes to k-12 education through private school vouchers and education savings accounts uh, and a lot of these other people do support the food stamps going to people instead of straight to government run, run right. grocery stores. And I think the only difference here is that the norm when it comes to groceries and uh, higher education and pre-K is that people already have a high degree of choice. When it comes to K through 12, there's a institution that has an entrenched special interest at profiting uh, from the status quo from getting your children's education dollars, regardless of your decision. So they fight really hard uh, against allowing families to take that money elsewhere. Makes sense. Makes sense. What's been the which leads me into my into my next point, because we have like this sort of teachers union um, thing that seems to be um, uh, like in the way <laughs> of a lot of uh, a lot of progress. Can you kind of break it down, certainly for my audience, the challenges? Because I don't think a lot of people understand mm -hmm. like that mammoth that you're having to deal with in, in a lot of the teachers unions. Like what? how do they let's say get in the way of progress in this particular subject matter whether it be either getting rid of uh, public education or more or more so which is probably more realistic in this sense funding the kids uh directly or the families directly so they can make decisions for them themselves as far as where their kid is going to go to yeah. school yeah i noted earlier that there's an entrenched special interest that profits off of getting your child's education dollars regardless of their satisfaction regardless of the choice of the family and that special interest that i'm alluding to is the teachers unions uh so they fight really hard and use their political power in numbers and they have a lot of revenue because they have so many members um you know i think there's about six million or more employees in the public school system in the united states that's uh, a lot of people uh, the largest teachers union, I want to say, has over 3 million members, the wow. National Education Association. The second largest teachers union has 1.7 million members, the American Federation for Teachers. And so they use all this political power and donations to political candidates to influence public policy. And as a monopoly, what they really like to fight against is allowing that money to go anywhere else. So they fight against things like public charter schools. They fight against things like education savings accounts or school voucher programs. They fight against any form of accountability that'll make their job more difficult. And that doesn't, we don't have to assume bad motives of the people that are fighting for these things. It's just irrationally responding to the messed up incentives that are baked into that traditional public right. school system. And so they're protecting that monopoly through political power. And, and I would argue that the bigger issue here is not necessarily the unions. It's more so that geographic monopoly that they have right. and coupling that power dynamic that they have in the K-12 education system with their political influence is the real problem. Because let's say a union went on strike, for example, in the private sector or, or a bunch of employees went on strike from Walmart. That wouldn't really bother me all that much because I could take my money to Trader Joe's or Whole Foods when a teacher's union has all their members close down all the public schools and then you can't take your child's education dollars to a private no. school. 
that's where the problem is. And so there's no feedback mechanism from the bottom up to hold the unions accountable when it comes to the public school system because of that geographic monopoly and because of that compulsory funding through the property tax system and, and other uh, forms of taxes as well. Man, makes sense. So like, uh, how has it been? Because you've again been front lines really in putting, you know, whether it be compiling the data and making this make sense for the common man to understand how bad this like really is. Or even even if we talk about the silver lining that the pandemic has lended us uh, to, to really, again, take an ax to this to this particular system. What has been the response that you've had to deal with. Cause I mean, anytime I, for example, talk against this public education, I'm, I'm spending like a week worth of content sitting there going back and forth with, uh, with either teachers, uh, that are part of these unions, government officials, or, or, or what have you. I, it seems like they get very, very emotional, but what's been your experience because you've been way uh, more front lines on, on this particular subject than I have in trying to like combat these sort of different, different uh, groups of people. Like what's been the experience with that? Well, yeah, I get the same thing too, as well. Obviously you've seen it on Twitter and everywhere else, but it's kind of sad that that's the case because uh, school choice benefits teachers too. If you think about it, if you look at the amount of money that we spend in the traditional public school system and then the amount that the teachers actually see when the teachers start complaining about things like they have to dig out of their pockets to pay for supplies each year, I kind of feel bad for them because the monopoly does not have any strong incentives to allocate those additional dollars to the classroom and to the teachers. So like, for example, if you look at a report from Ben Scafidi's uh, uh, Kennesaw State University's professor, Ben Scafidi, he looked at the data from 1992 to 2014 over that time, the United States increased per pupil education expenditures by about uh, 27%, even after adjusting for inflation. And in the, over that same time period, teacher salaries in real terms actually dropped by 2%. So they're throwing all, all this money into the system. It's going towards administrative bloat, and it's yep. going towards uh, the higher ups in the system and, and increasing support staff, which benefits the unions because that leads to a larger voting block and more political power. And then also more union dues from having more people in the system, but it doesn't do all that much to help individual families or individual teachers. And if you look at the evidence on the subject that look at the effects of school choice competition, either through charter schools in the area or private school choice programs and the effects on the teacher salaries in the public school system, all five of those studies that I've seen on the topic find that that competition leads to higher teacher salaries in the public school system which most people don't think about all that much, but it's because the traditional public schools start to realize that, well, you know what, if uh, people can go somewhere else, then um, they might be able to take some of their money with them. So I better start to allocate my resources wisely. And so what the public schools do is they start to pour more money into the classroom in response to that competition, then teacher salaries actually go up. But I see this all the time, and this is actually why I have this new co-edited book with uh, Cato Institute's Neil McCluskey, mm -hmm. School Choice Miss. You, I mean, you, you, you hear the defensiveness in the debate, and sometimes it's from teachers, which I think that's unfounded coming from teachers. But everybody on this uh, who's watching this has heard the myth that uh, school choice defunds the public schools. I mean, that's the, that's the number one thing that you hear. But my quick response to that is that school choice doesn't defund public schools. Public schools defund families. Mm. School choice just returns that money to the hands of the rightful owners by allowing families to take that money back to the public school if they want. But if not, they can also take it to a private school or a home school. I know some of your <laughs> listeners may be thinking, well, the, the rightful owners are actually the taxpayers. But this <laughs> takes it. This takes us in a step in the right, right direction. Absolutely. Money is supposed absolutely. to be meant for educating the child. Absolutely. It's not supposed to be for, meant for propping up and protecting this government monopoly. So it's a step in the right direction. And look, Inherent in that argument that school choice defunds public schools is this admission, at least an impl implicit or explicit admission, that uh, the public schools aren't doing a good job. Right. If you think that giving families an option will lead to defunding public schools, what's well, because you think that they're going to choose something else when given the freedom to do so? Why right. is that? Why, why do you feel the need to, to force the families to keep their kids in the traditional schools? And that happens to be that these arguments against school choice disproportionately apply to the least advantaged because more advantaged families already have school choice in a sense. They can already afford to live in the neighborhoods that tend to be residentially assigned to the best uh, government run schools. And they could also be more likely at least to afford to pay out of pocket for private school tuition and fee. So in that sense, 
funding students directly with the money that already exists in the system is an equalizer. Makes sense. Like, so with that being said, how deep does it run? Because I think there's a big uh, assumption, you know, we, we kind of touched on it earlier about the, the politics of it all. Right. And but how deep is it? Can you give us some perspective on that when you look at like sometimes we think of these teachers unions and they seem to go like hand in hand with like one particular party, you know, being the, mm -hmm. you know, the Democratic Party and them supporting their candidates and all of that. Like how deep is the political aspect, be it with the teachers unions or the public education? Is there as there maybe more perspective that you can give us on that particular yeah. topic? Yeah, I think it should be a nonpartisan issue. Look, I mean, when school choice, uh, one of the first programs started in 1990 in Milwaukee was a bipartisan effort. It was, you know, championed by a Democrat, actually. But today, it's true that um, if you look at who votes for expanding school choice programs, it tends to be Republican. Sometimes you get a diffractor from from uh, from the de Democrat side. Sometimes Republicans will vote against it, but by and large, Republicans are much more likely to support school choice initiatives and Democrats. And you hinted a little bit up about the funding issue. Um, the latest data that I've seen in the most recent election cycle uh, reported by Open Secrets, a nice website if you want to go check it yeah. out, is that the American Federation for Teachers, the second largest teachers union, 99.3% or, or somewhere around that number, 99.4% of their donations went to Democrats. Wow. Um, some to independents and then well less, much less than 1% went to Republicans. So that plays a role there. And I think it's part of the reason why Joe Biden might have not said anything about, about charter schools at all, in, at least on his official campaign website. If you did a control F and look for the word charter school or school choice, he didn't even mention it because yeah. If he came out in favor of charter schools, well, then the teachers unions would be upset with him. If he came out against charter schools too, too, too much in the open, then a lot of his constituents that benefit from charter schools that would otherwise vote for him would probably be upset about that. So um, it, it, it is it, when it comes to the voters, it's a bipartisan or nonpartisan issue that the majority of people from a lot of different backgrounds support school choice. But then when it comes to the people in office, um, Democrats do tend to be a lot less likely to vote for it. And the, the most recent example that I can come up with is in Ohio. They just expanded their private school voucher program by about their income limit by about 25 percent. The governor just signed uh, the, the, a bill out there earlier, in, I think at least like, like a, under a month ago. And every single Democrat voted against it in the House and the Senate. And every single Republican voted for it in the Senate, but in the House, most Republicans voted for it, but about a handful of them voted against it. But it still passed because the legislative makeup in Ohio. Makes sense. What so strategically? I mean, uh, like with you, with this being your expertise, like where do you think that we go? Like you know, we talk about libertarians, obviously, a lot of us being very passionate about this particular subject, and and um, you know, a lot of us are as unapologetic as possible about it. I know I'm one of those those guys have been that's what gets me in trouble with these groups quite often but what do you think the emphasis should be if we are to within our lifetimes right uh definitely now with the with the opportunity that we have if we are in our lifetime to try to get money back in the to the hands of the parents of the families and let's let's have a more uh, market, let's say, solution in terms of education, which is all that we've talked about. That's what we're working towards. What is it that we can do realistically um, to try to get to that point uh, from a strategic standpoint? Because I think that's pro perhaps the most important. Yeah, I think the best program that is being um, uh, introduced in legislature, state legislatures all across the country is something called an education savings account. So when I talk about school choice, I talk about funding students instead of institutions, redirecting the dollars from the government institutions to individual families who could then choose to take it back or they could take it to any government approved education provider of a service. Um, so that's, that's the name of these things. Some people call them education scholarship accounts, but the ESA is the acronym. And it's, the, it's that basic idea of redirecting the dollars to wherever the family chooses. You, it, it has to be a government approved education expenditure though, because there are some people who may think that, well, maybe these families will use it on 
booze right, and maybe yeah. they'll spend it on non-education expenditures or, right. or other things like that. So each of these programs that I've seen in state in states across the country, they have some type of provision in the bill to make sure it's used for education expenditures. I would argue even if that provision wasn't in place, the families would do a better job on net making those decisions than the bureaucrats in the government school system. There's so many wasteful decisions in the public school system when it comes to uh, the spending that already exists in the, in, in the in the education establishment. But just to make uh, people happy, there is that provision in, in those bills. We had a couple of bills in Congress at the federal level uh, this, this past year. I think there was about five or six. For example, Rand Paul had the School Act, which was a step in the right direction that I, I argued because it would, it would re- uh, structure all of the federal education, nearly all of the federal education funding, which shouldn't exist in the first place because education is in the in the Constitution. But it would restructure the money that's already being spent and allow families to direct it through that education savings account mechanism that had no chance of passing because of the split Congress. Um, it was never going to pass the House unless. Uh, Rand, you know, Rand Paul was trying to get it attached to a stimulus bill, which then it would, it might have had a, uh, a chance of passing, but uh, it was, it never got attached to, to any stimulus bill, and that was kind of a far-fetched um, uh, proposal as well. But look, I mean, a lot of libertarians uh, support school choice, but I, I do want to point out that there are some libertarians who make the perfect the enemy of the good. And Eric, I'm with you. I'm an am. I, which I, I think you're an anarcho-capitalist. Yep. Uh, I'm a voluntarist, anarcho-capitalist, yep. whatever you want to call it. I've written uh, articles on police choice, uh, police vouchers, same kind of idea, and incremental reform in the in the right direction. But within the framework that that we exist and the political structures that exist today, I would argue funding students as as opposed to institutions is a step in the right direction. And the way that I like to put it to other libertarians who may be skeptical of of funding students directly is I ask them, would you would you rather have uh, food stamps for everybody where you have to use them at the government run grocery store that you're residentially assigned to, or would you rather have food stamps for everybody everybody that you can use at private providers of grocery services as well? I would. <laughs> I would say neither, but if you had to choose between one and the other, I would rather have the funding for everybody and then you at least have people be able to take that funding to different providers of the service. And the reality is today, we essentially already do have the food stamps for everybody that have to be used at the government run institution that you're residentially assigned to. That is the K through 12 public school system. So um, a step in the right direction is to allow families to choose. And then, and then also, a similar argument is that this will lead to government encroachment and control over the private schools. That is a possibility, but if you look at the existing programs today, all of these programs tend to be a lot less regulated than the government-run schools. And so even if these programs do come with strings attached, on net, you'll have people uh, exiting the government-run schools and then going in, into private schools that will be less regulated than the government run schools. And then my other response to that is it's all voluntary. You can shoot, private schools can choose to take the money or not, which a lot of them turn it down and remain specialized. Um, and then also families can choose to use the money or not. So if you can, each individual family can make that cost benefit decision for themselves of whether to take the money. Same thing with the private schools. Yeah. I mean, and for, it, I mean, ahead, for example, it, in Louisiana, it, it's a pretty regulated school choice program. I think it's overregulated, but two thirds of the private schools said, no, nah, I'm not gonna take the money. And so you still have this market of highly specialized schools, but because the funding follows the student, you can allow for more private schools to enter the market than exists today. I mean, only 9% of students are in uh, private schools today and, and with a fully uh, a, a full education savings account funding the student directly program, you'd, you would expect much more than 9% of students to have access to private schools. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, with that being uh, said, like uh, going into the future, I mean, please lay it on us right here um, because this is going to be the last segment. I want to hear like, what are you working on? You know, just talk about your book, uh, but what else are you working on going into the future with some of the like sort of organizations, institutions that you are involved with that are really leading the charge on this episode, uh, excuse me, on, on this particular subject, what all do you have like in store? 
Yeah, I've got a bunch of, uh, I have the national regulations experiment where I'm trying to see what regulations dissuade private schools from accepting those uh, private school voucher dollars. So I'm starting on working on that. I've already got initial results. I'm not going to tell you the, the main, the, the overall results, but the main picture is some regulations deter the private schools from sure. participating. And the obvious policy uh, implication there is, well, don't regulate the program so much if you want people to have access to more schools. Um, and so don't tie so many, too many, so, so much red tape to those decisions. Um, and then also I'm um, trying to get data from the Florida Department of Education and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to link their private school choice program to adult criminal activity, because okay. uh, there have been six studies on the topic that link school choice to crime. I've done two of them in uh, looking at the Milwaukee voucher program. All six of these studies are peer reviewed and they all find that gaining access either to a charter school or a private school through a voucher program has led to significantly uh, large reductions in certain types of crimes. Okay, And that could be because uh, the quality of a school is multidimensional. It could be that their sh parents are choosing the school based on safety, based on the culture of the school. Uh, and all of these things could lead to reductions in uh, cr cr criminal activity that is um, uh, that is being partaking part that 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 the uh, students are partaking in. So okay. that's going forward. Um, obviously, always com combating school choice myths, and then I, I see in the in the near future combating myths even more so coming from the new administration. Um, once that happens. So uh, we've already seen uh, arguments coming from the national policy director associated with the uh, Biden administration calling to defund uh, charter schools, at least you, yeah, uh, for, for particular types of charter schools, uh, defunding their, their federal dollars, but not doing the same for traditional public schools, uh, and then calling for more regulations for charter schools. So I expect I'll be responding to a lot of that and then continuing to talk about the school reopening debate. I mean, yeah, everything else pretty much is fighting to reopen. Public schools are still closed in so many places. And I think it's it's all because we don't have school choice. Yeah. Um, or a lot of it is because we don't have school choice. If we did, you'd have competitive pressure, pressures to reopen just like you do with so many other businesses. I mean, if, you're, if your grocery store doesn't reopen, you can take your money somewhere else. If your school doesn't reopen, you should simply be able to take your money somewhere else. Yeah, right there. Well, with that being said, where can uh, the audience find you, your work, um, anything that you are a part of so they can also uh, get a glance at some of the things that you mentioned? Yeah, Twitter. I mean, I, I that's the uh, main place to check out all my stuff. I, I share all of my longer form articles there. It's at DeAngelis Corey. But you can also find my longer form stuff directly at uh, Reason Foundation. Mm -hmm. So if you type in Google Corey reason foundation i'm the only one there you'll you'll find my web page perfect perfect well we're gonna have you obviously back on the show because this is like an ever developing thing on this subject definitely as we talk to to reopening and i know this stupid vaccine thing is starting to be a part of the conversation we'll see how that impacts the schools because i think in like maybe in a month we're gonna have another update and this is gonna be interesting to see what the data says and what direction that everything uh is going in there so Corey, i appreciate you joining me uh for four can a second and we'll have all the all that information in the show notes that you gave us and um again guys if you aren't familiar with Corey, you need to be following him on twitter I would he's my go to when it comes to this particular subject because he's killing it uh, uh, right now. And he also understands the you, people talk. Give me crap for being pragmatic on certain things. He is one of us that understands sort of that approach and being realistic and moving in the right direction, which is towards liberty when it comes to what is so I mean, it, it's so ripe. Uh, and so ch we, where we cherish this sort of institution when it comes to pop uh, schooling and education, it's something that I think people should, of course, pay attention to. Uh, but uh, we can hopefully move in a direction. So, Corey, I appreciate you joining me before Kenneth's sake. Hey, thanks so much, Eric. All right. Thank you.